Next on the Broadway show, get ready to fall in love on the rocks with Robin Herter. We're hanging out with one of the stars of the Neil Diamond musical, A Beautiful Noise. Plus, how do you measure your life? Original Rent star Anthony Rapp is here to talk about his new one-man show, Without You. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show. So glad you're with us for this latest edition of The Broadway Show. It's going to be a good one. I'm Tamsin Fidel. She's forever in blue jeans. Robin Herter is one of the stars of A Beautiful Noise, the Neil Diamond musical. She plays Neil's wife of 25 years, Marsha Murphy. Let's send it out to Paul Wontorek. That's right, Tamsin. Robin Herter is definitely wowing crowds in the Feel Good musical. We met up before matinee to talk about her impactful year and why this gig feels like home. Robin, it's so good to see you on this end of the pandemic. <laughs> I know, we it's did so it. nice to see you. I know that you are someone who lives in gratitude, especially about your career. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like this is such a great moment for you because, you know, during the pandemic, Moulin Rouge, you obviously yes. were in Nini and Moulin Rouge, it shut down and you got a Tony nomination while you were at home. That, that just suddenly happened. So wild. While you were waiting for the show to come back. Tony Awards happened, the show finally came back. Now you're back on Broadway in a new musical, A Beautiful Noise. I know that you don't always assume the next job is right around the corner. No, never. Once I left Moulin Rouge, I was so prepared to just be a mom, take a seat in my house in the woods and just enjoy life, mm -hmm. uh, give my body a rest finally. But when this audition came up just two months later and then I saw what the role was and I was like, I think I should probably go in for this. And I did and it happened so quickly. Wow. And then all of a sudden within three days I had another Broadway show. And that's when you just kind of, um, you release and you throw your hands up and say, take it away, universe, because I'm not gonna fight it. I'm like, clearly this is meant to be, and I'm so grateful and I'm going to embrace it and go on another journey that was completely unexpected. Never in my life would I ever expect that I would be starring in the Neil Diamond musical. <laughs> <laughs> right. I still laugh. It is the most fun I've ever had, and wow. it's the happiest I've ever been on stage. Why do you think this show is giving you all that? I think there's so, so many things. Number one, the people. Not every day does a group of people like right. this all come together in, in one environment and it just makes for a really enjoyable workplace. But also, the nature of this show, mm -hmm. I love shows that make you feel all the feels. Mm -hmm. And when people hear Neil Diamond, you know, the Neil Diamond musical, right. they're gonna be like, okay, sequins, and yeah, well, yes. <laughs> you, get, you get the sequins, and you get the fringe, and you get the songs, but, you get his story as well, and um, a lot of people don't know it. Yeah. Mark Jacoby, who yes. plays Neil now, and his performance that he gives in this show, especially at the end, the audience isn't expecting that. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we get to just give you exactly what you want, we flip it around, and we get to just embrace this glorious music and this amazing musician and get to sing together and dance together and hold hands and put our arms around each other and sway back and forth, and it's like, Anybody who does not feel that kind of flaming sparkle joy that's happening at the end of this show, then you don't have a soul. You play Marsha, Neil Diamond's second wife. Yes. Who he is no longer married to. Nope. And Neil Diamond is around. He, he's mm -hmm. very much involved in yep. the process of this. You're playing his ex-wife. Mm -hmm. uh, is that odd? Is there any? Is there uh, anything? Yeah. I mean, obviously, there's and and there's a lot of her story in in the musical. There really is, yeah. which I I wasn't expecting. I have to say, I this was very intimidating for me yeah, because sure. the roles that I've been able to create on Broadway have been um, made up. <laughs> <laughs> and they've right. not worn a lot of clothing yeah. and they really like to yeah. dance and express themselves. So this one, I'm like, hmm, not only do, do I get to wear clothes in this show, um, <laughs> I'm creating a, a, a real human that's mm -hmm. here, that's alive. And with Marsha, um, there is not a whole lot of information about her. She's, she's led a very, very private life mm. since the divorce. And 
she helped create this lifestyle, this Neil Diamond that everyone adores and loves, which kind of turned into a beautiful monster. And um, unfortunately, relationships are the ones that are sacrificed. And it was, you know, 25 years. I saw the show a couple days before opening. Mm -hmm. I found out a week later that your dad, Dennis, had passed. Mm -hmm. I was extra blown away having witnessed your performance that day, knowing that that had happened. Yeah. And I, 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 I have to ask you, did the, did the whole cast know? No. You were really focused on the good of the show and getting the show opened. Mm -hmm. And I just don't, I, I just can't imagine what that was like. I literally, on Tuesday morning when I found out, I didn't know what to do. I'm like, should I run home to Maine and be with my family? And it was, you know, my mom and my brothers that were like, Robin, what are you gonna do? You gonna sit here and cry with us? Dad knows this is the most important, important week. And he would be so upset if you missed it because of him. And because the number one thing my dad loved most in this world is watching me perform. And I knew, I, I knew deep down after like freaking out for the whole day, I was like, this is what he wants. But I didn't tell anybody just because I'm always a mom and I'm always, I always want to take everybody under my wing and, and let yeah. take care of them first. And I didn't, I didn't say anything until um, I wanted to wait until after opening because then I was going to go home to Maine for the service and everything. And but on Friday, the Friday before opening, um, his obituary had come out, and so I started getting messages from people in Maine. And these are some of the closest people in my life now, and I'm like, this doesn't feel right. Um, so I told them all, and I said, what I don't, I don't want any sad eyes unless I have sad eyes. Let's just. Like, what I need is exactly what we're doing every night. It was actually a beautiful escape mm -hmm. to go into the theater and you just weirdly compartmentalize your feelings. Yeah. And it's not that you forget about it, it just goes back there. And it was actually so therapeutic to just like shut it off and just get to do what I love most. I'm just very grateful from the time that I had with him and, and how amazingly supportive he was. But I'm okay, I mean, I'm a tough cookie. Again, I thank God for this show. I thank God for Broadway. I thank God that I, I get to do this life because it's um, it's just so special and I'm so grateful. So we have to get you to the theater. Let's let's, let's walk, walk down on It's cold out, so let's put our-, our I know, but I'm from Maine, so. <laughs> That's why everyone's like, aren't you cold? And I'm like, Maine. So you're actually at the Broadhurst, which is one of my favorite theaters. I love, I have so many great memories from like my early, theater going at the Broadhurst, it's a beautiful theater. The first time I walked in, I felt like I'd officially arrived. Even though I've, this is my seventh Broadway show, I was like, something about this seems so historic. Yeah, it's really, I feel very, very fortunate and special to be working at the Broadhurst. This area, do you remember like the first time you came to New York and like- Oh, do I? Yeah. Oh my God, it's it's burned in my memory. But, oh, look. Oh yeah, there's your, look. you're over there, there's your billboard. There's me. Yeah. Well, sort of. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, my first time here was, uh, I was 11 years old. We stayed at the Marriott Marquis. Yeah, and that's when we saw Damn Yankees was playing Oh, at... wow, which I know was a big one for you. And that was my first Broadway show, and I mean, I've told you this, I've told everybody this, but I was like, <laughs> that's what I want to do when I grow up, and, uh, and I, I am. You're getting ready for the matinee. The matinees are lit. They are. As the children say. Lit. It's our first matinee. I didn't realize my mic was up because I'm about to start the scene into Song Sung Blue. Uh -huh. And my mic was up. <laughs> and at the end of Cracklin' Rosie, everyone's screaming. I'm like, oh my God, these people are lit. <laughs> <laughs> just, and it was broadcast it was in the all, theater. It just brought <laughs> radio. amazing. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much. Go, oh, go kill him. I, I'm going to try. I'm going to try to kill him twice today. <laughs> twice, two show day. Mm -hmm. it's Broadway. It's you can do it. I know I you know. can do it. I'm, 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 I'm still excited, so that's good. Awesome. Yeah. All right, have a good one. Good Thanks to see you. you. All right. All right. I'll see ya. All right, bye. You like what you just saw? Well, there's an exclusive extended web version of this interview over at Broadway.com. All hail.
hail the new Queens of Six the Musical. You gotta respect the royalty of this pop concert extravaganza. It's a, such an exciting thing to come into something that's already a hit. You don't really have to worry about mm. the, like the show proving itself. You could just come in and like honor what you bring as an individual and as an actor and, and just step into something that's got a great legacy and, and people are rooting for you. The Queendom is something I've never experienced before. That kind of fan base. I've never been in a show where somebody's singing the lyrics to you. And that can be a little scary, you know, but at the same time, it's exciting because they're not saying it to you because they're like, you're saying it wrong. They're saying it to you because they're like, I'm right there with you, queen. At the core, it has this this feeling of like, they want to accept everyone and, they, and it's full of positivity and full of love. So I definitely felt that going into it, I felt very almost like supported in a way. I was like, I can't wait to find my Kay Howard. Um, and they've been very receptive to, to everything that we've been doing. <laughs> it's quite empowering um, that they are rooting for you this way because swings weren't always appreciated the way they are now. And of course, things can be better, but we're so loved and especially in this show. When the cast was announced, I probably jumped within a couple of days a thousand followers and a whole bunch of people in the inbox welcome, 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 oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And so people love to see our individuality that we bring to the roles. You know, there are moments in the show where we are allowed to riff differently, which like was very fun in the process getting to find. Neja does a crazy opt up at the end of her get down. It's insane. It's gorgeous. <laughs> um, that's really fun. I think that I think people love to come see that and see like a new version of songs they already love. It appeals to kind of anyone of any age um, and it gives everyone a, a feeling of empowerment but also it's so funny yeah. so it brings so much joy to people like there's nothing better than laughing and you know this show where we're inviting them to laugh with us and just have a good time for an hour and a half who doesn't like that and it so it makes me want to come back again and again and again which is awesome the Broadway show is back in just a sec It's been 27 years since Rent changed musical theater forever. Now the show's original lead is back on the New York City stage. Anthony Rapp has brought his solo memoir musical, Without You, to New World Stages. You've had quite an interesting seven weeks, right? New yes. dad. Yes. Um, what, is, what is more of a challenge, the show or, or new dad? Well, the challenge has been in this last couple of weeks when I'm gone for like nine, ten hours a day, being just leaving because, you know, he's growing so fast. So it's like I, li I literally left one morning, came back at night to feed him. And I felt like he was bigger in my arms than he was in the morning. So that's challenging. But I, sure. I am I feel like I am able to, like, focus on the work when I'm here and then focus on him when I'm there. But it's the leaving that's the hardest part. I yeah. feel like the, the interesting part, though, is where your life is right now and then what you're talking about yeah. when you're at work. I mean, obviously leading yeah. up to where you are now, but talk a little bit about that juxtaposition because that's that's a big one. That's Well, one of the things in anticipation of having Rai was knowing that my mom wouldn't get to meet him. Being in the show, I'm, I'm channeling her. I'm, I'm talking to her and her energy is very present. So I feel like in a way he's getting to m meet her through me, I don't know. It, it, I don't know. I don't want to sound too like woo woo about it, but her presence feels very present, and so that's a piece that I wouldn't have expected, and it's been really um, comforting because it is still incredibly bittersweet that that he won't get to know his grandma in in the flesh. Sure. But I think he's going to get to know her spirit. That is something that you do, and I think the more you talk about somebody, you you uh, make them feel very much alive. I lost my mother at a, a young age, so that that presence is you know is really felt. But you talking about her, you know, each every performance for a significant amount of yeah. time in a, in a real uh, deep way that a lot of times you don't do that when you lose somebody. What, what has that been like for you? Have you gotten to know her better? I think so. And part of it is that because it's a because I'm, I'm playing her, too. And when I'm saying playing her, it doesn't mean like I'm doing like a full impression. It's more like a like a handprint rather than like a full mask. Mm -hmm. So, but I'm, she's speaking to me, so I'm hearing her words. You know, when someone's gone from the world, they are gone. Sure. And you, you know, it's important to rec to honor that truth. And that not only are they gone, but also a part of you is gone in a sense, because who you were for them is also a little bit gone, but also who you were for them is still with you. So it's, it's, it's all of it. I don't know, I recommend for people to write a letter to their loved ones who are gone. I, that was something that was recommended to me a long time ago, and I was like, really? I did the same thing. I, I was like, I'm not doing that. And yeah. then, no, it, 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 
it makes a difference and I, and I think that that also helps. It helps remember that person in a way that, that you want to and in a very clear way because as more years go by, that, that is a lot more difficult. You know, we were beginning to really become adult friends. You know, I think there's a, sure. there are phases of parent-child relationships. And I was 25 when she died. And now, as I've gotten older, I, there are so many more things we could have talked about, you know, with even more insight. So that's the other thing I try to imagine some of those conversations where they could have been or would be. Let me ask you this, how do you feel each night when you come out on the stage and look where, where you, where, you know, we all look at where we started and where we've been, but you're really going and reliving it out there because you lived it very publicly. I feel um, like it's so vivid, like it's not that I'm having to reach back in memory. Sure. And it never, and you know, the whole experience in the first place was so intense. And I read a book years ago, talk, like this is, talking about like when th intense things happen, the traumatic part would be PTSD, but that your neural pathway, pathways get carved by it. Mm -hmm. That's what it feels like. It's like, I don't have to, th I don't have to go, hmm, what was that, that day happened. like when that happened? It, it's right there. So th I feel like it's, I, it, it gets evoked, it's present and I'm really in it, but it's also, I get to the sharing of it gets reflected back and it gets kind of released, if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, it makes total sense. Talk about that. Uh, talk about rent. And, you know, I know that you've got people that come in here and that and they just relive it with you, uh, probably right down to that minute. Many probably met you. Many, mm -hmm. you know, have followed your career and uh, and cheered you on. What does that feel like? It feels like uh, I'm being held in a really lovely way. Wilson Jermaine Heredia, who the original Angel, came to the first preview and... Uh, wow. You know, as he was out there, like I'm talking about the things that we we lit, we were in the room together when these things happened, and I did wonder, is this too much for him? Is it going to be hard? You know, and he was very moved by it and felt like I told the truth about it, and that was very gratifying to hear. Did you ever think, when you were standing on that stage as a first performance of Rent, that it would be what it is today, all these years later? No, I didn't think it would be like an international phenomenon. I mean, it's just. I, but I did think it was, I did think from the first day of rehearsal that it was something really, really special. But as you probably know, as somebody who follows theater, there's any number of things over the years that are really special and just yes. don't catch fire for whatever reason. And then there are the things that do catch fire for the right reasons. So I hoped that Rent would be one of those and then it was. Plus the fact that Jonathan Larson wasn't there it was incredibly comforting that his legacy would live on and that his work would be recognized even in, in his absence. The experience of seeing Hamilton, a lot of people told me it was like seeing Rent in the sense that it was something that was so groundbreaking and so moving and exciting. And so when I saw Hamilton for the first time and I had that feeling, then I thought this is if this is what people said that they felt that Rent, it just about Rent, it just made it that much more um, moving to me to be a part of Rent in the first place. Oh, to that's know interesting. because Hamilton. Yeah. was one of the most incredible experiences I've ever had in the theater. So that they're, that they're kind of kindred spirits in that way is really wonderful. Want to see more of my interview? Head over to broadway.com for an extended cut. We'll be right back. Welcome back to The Broadway Show. I'm Tamsin Fidel. Let's get back to it. MTV is out with a new reality series called The Real Friends of WeHo, featuring some of West Hollywood's most influential LGBTQ plus personalities, including choreographer, singer, and Broadway vet, Todrick Hall. Let's send it out to Charlie Cooper. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, I wanna know a little bit about how you're feeling right now, now that The Real Friends of WeHo is out into the world. And yeah, your baby is like truly out into the world. <laughs> um, I, I feel great about it. I, I root for any opportunity for there to be queer representation, more diversity on television. So I'm really, really stoked. How are you protecting your mental health in regards to the comments that you're receiving? But then also you have so much going on. You're incredibly busy. Um, so how are you avoiding like burnout as well? Well, I think that growing up doing ballet and doing musical theater has honestly prepared me for everything. I mean, the work ethic that you have to have in order to be able to make it on Broadway doing eight shows a week is something that's almost unheard of here in La La Land. As far as my mental health goes, that's a constant struggle and battle and a very delicate dance that I do with myself, depending on what version of Todrick I wake up as on any given day. Uh, was there anything captured that you asked to be taken out, maybe because you felt like you revealed too much 
No, there wasn't anything, but I, I did feel like I was just, th th what I love about this show for me and my own personal experience is that most of my reality experience has been competition based and I am a competitive person. I've had to be. When you're black and you're in musical theater, especially back in the day when diversity was for just absolutely not a thing, you had to go into the room and I, every other black man in the room and understand that most likely you were gonna be the token and you had to beat all those people out. We are all, just now, oftentimes people of color are seeing the world as a place that legitimately has opportunity now. You have to figure out how to how to navigate that space because it's a space that no one I've ever known has has been in. That's going to do it for us. But until next time, check out the Broadway Show Uncut wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is the Broadway Show.